Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're coming to us from today. I'm Jesse Andrews. I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado, virtually here. Beautiful uh, spring day. Uh, we appreciate you all taking time. A lot of questions pre-webinar. Uh, we expect some more. Just keep in mind at the bottom, we do have the Q&A feature. Go ahead and filter those questions in there as you have new questions. And for those that we do not uh, have time to address, we will make sure and follow up with you. Uh, also, if you wouldn't mind towards the end of the webinar, uh, please also take the survey. Um, we are going to have a brief survey on this, just things you want to hear about more in the future, et cetera. Uh, today, I'm joined by Robert Michaud, Chief Investment Officer, and Joy Zeng, Senior Research Analyst at New Frontier. Uh, they're going to be doing most of the speaking today. And then towards the end of our event here, uh, Dr. Richard Michaud, CEO and founder of New Frontier, is also going to be joining us uh, to get his thoughts and perspective during uh, the Q&A feature. And I'll be chiming in. We have a couple polls. Um, but just keep in mind that if you do need to jump off, this will be recorded and available to you uh, in the near future once we get that compliance approved. And so with that, um, as we said, it's, it's titled Tug of War for a reason. Um, just a lot going on from in inflation to interest rates to uh, there was even uh, last night mention of the R word. Um, although uh, the R word in the retail space, I think is, uh, I heard once the word recession in the retail world is when your neighbor loses a job. And I think a depression is when you lose your job. So people are worried about their neighbors right now. And uh, this is our agenda. We're gonna to touch on our investment process for those of you that are a little bit newer to New Frontier, discuss some of the asset allocation changes, go over the performance. Joy's gonna do that for us. And then Robert's gonna come back on and uh, do some insights, perspective, and we'll close it out with some Q&A. Uh, so with that, uh, why don't I go ahead and turn it over uh, to Robert Michaud, CIO. CIO. Thanks, Jesse. Um, let's grab the screen here. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, and of course, uh, we put a lot of work into investments, and when you have a quarter or a few months like what has happened recently, where things have not gone the way any of us would have liked in the uh, as far as markets go, uh, we want to put some focus on what's happened, understand what's going on, investigate uh, really seriously uh, what has led to uh, the situation, and make sure that our portfolios are working the way they should, make sure that our understanding of markets is still relevant. And it, one way I was thinking of it is it's a lot like what the NTSB does after a plane crash, which is that you want to, you can't change what happened, but you want to make darn sure that you really understand what happened so that it, you can prevent something like this from happening again, if that's at all possible. So that's what we're going to be spending a lot of today doing. So be, um, <clears throat> Before I get into specifics about what's going on, I thought we would start with our investment process. And our, we, this is really central to our approach to investing. We are always thinking about what do we understand? What does the world look like? What is the risk and return trade off? And then really focus on optimizing a portfolio for uh, different investment objectives that really fit and are as scientific an approach as possible. And I was also thinking that given the amount of uncertainty in the, in the world, given the number of ways that the future can go that we really have no idea about, no one does, and they can be pretty dispersed, that's the whole tug of war concept, that uh, I wanted to relate to that uh, to our investment process. So our investment process is based on how do you take a scientific approach to investing, given that you don't know what the future holds, you don't have realistic and precise estimates of risk and return, you have a, a general sense of what the risk and return trade-offs are and what asset classes are more risky or less risky, relatively speaking, and as, as well as return. So instead of taking Markowitz's Nobel Prize winning work and applying that directly, which is what most sophisticated investment firms try to do, we came up with a, a new theory to made a new efficient frontier where you're looking at thousands of ways that uh, markets can work out 
not exactly the way you'd expect. And this picture here is showing the very surprising relationship where the best portfolio to invest in each of these scenarios can be wildly different. And that was an insight that made us wonder, well, is there a better way to invest given how wrong Markowitz can be, given how wrong one specific view of the world can lead to investment decisions? And this is the work that my dad and I did where we came up with this new efficient frontier where he said, this idea is, is so interesting, so widely applicable that we just got to start a company based on this. And, and so here we are uh, 20 something, 25 years later almost. But this new efficient frontier, what it does is it looks at the many different ways the future can unfold and comes up with a scientific process to have a well-diversified portfolio that's going to do the best on average, be as robust as possible, be as intelligently diversified, given that you don't know what the future holds and all sorts of risks are uh, possible coming down the, down the path. And so that's what this dark blue line in this sea of future uncertainty is. And then the uh, last thing is I, about this is I just want to talk a little bit broader about our investment process, which is in addition to thinking about building an optimized portfolio, we're also trying to make sure that we're doing a lot quality control in a lot of other ways. So serious approach to risk management, thinking about uh, making sure we're not speculating, not taking big bets on anything, having a really consistent, really thoughtful investment process. And all of this combined with our, our approach to optimization is really designed to say, we don't know what the future is. There's a, no one can promise a guarantee a return, but we want to reduce the dispersion as much as possible. And that's what this picture on the right is, is showing uh, you. And then uh, finally, uh, when things are changing a lot, you wanna make sure that your portfolios are being monitored. And so how to monitor a portfolio, uh, hopefully you understand that we come up with these highly optimized portfolios for a certain type of an investor. Uh, your investor invests in them, but then what happens, right? the world happens, prices start to change, and the portfolio you had before is probably no longer that optimal anymore as prices start to change. The other important thing, which is really what's going on these days, is that the world changes, the risk environment changes, the interest rate environment, expectations about future equity volatility change. And so you, you need to think about what's the new portfolio you should be investing in. Interestingly, since everything went down, what's got, happened recently is a lot more of the uh, optimal portfolios changing. The, the concept of what's the right portfolio to be investing for the future has changed more than the portfolio had in the past because unfortunately everything went down in portfolios and surprisingly everything went down at fairly similar rates. So that's our, that's our rebalance test. And I'm going to show you that actually uh, we did a lot of trading uh, at the around the turn of the year. Um, we rebalanced essentially all of our portfolios at the turn of the year. And that was because of things that had happened earlier, obviously not because we were anticipating uh, Russia to invade Ukraine, but uh, because of we mostly changes in the fixed income environment that were already becoming apparent. Uh, it was already a heightened volatility in fixed income. There was already uh, less reason to be investing in duration in, fi uh, uh, in the fixed income portion of your portfolio. Not no reason, but less reason. And so we made, and we were concerned about inflation. So we made some changes to the portfolio. One uh, big one that was clear was China. Uh, in uh, Chinese regulatory environment, it wasn't we weren't thinking about COVID zero so much. We were thinking about the Chinese regulatory environment and how investors would be rewarded. So uh, we removed China, which had been extremely helpful to the portfolio, remember, through much of the pandemic, but uh, no longer was as important. We wanted to also understand that fixed income volatility is much higher. So how can you maintain overall portfolio consistent risk targets without just buying more stocks. And one of our solutions was uh, to add international min volatility, uh, IFA V, there to the portfolio. And one thing that allowed us to do is uh, lower overall bond exposure while maintaining portfolio risk. 
as well as lower the duration within the bond por uh, <laughs> portion of the portfolio. And uh, while, uh, and, and just to, yeah, and a, and a final thing was in our multi-asset income, we also included uh, uh, tips into the portfolio for uh, reasons of concerns about inflation risk. So I'm going to uh, stop there, and then I'm going to let Joy tell you about what really happened to the portfolios in a more specific way. And then I, I can uh, talk uh, more later about what's going on in markets, and we're looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Oh, great. Thanks, Robert. And um, hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time to join us. So in this section, I'm going to give you an update of Q1 performance, really focusing on our portfolios and asset classes we invest in. So what makes Q1 an unusual and also very volatile quarter is that we're experiencing this investment regime shift from falling yields and modest inflation that were pervasive over the last 40 years to the current state where we have this surprisingly high inflation, CPI above 8%, and at the same time, strong labor markets. And this has compelled Feds to take a more aggressive approach to tame price pressure. And this has fundamentally changed the yield curve. And we're seeing that short treasuries have risen dramatically by more than 160 basis points, much faster than the pace of 10 years treasury yields change, and which has, um, induced a partially inverted yield curve. Um, markets are currently pricing in a, at least night rate hikes at the end of 2022, which put Fed's implied rate to be close to 2.7% by the end of this year. And during the last quarter, I mentioned how markets were effectively and you know looking at uh, Fed's policy. And this quarter, even more dominant focus was put on Fed. And, and as a result, there are a lot of unknowns and uncertainties around realization of future rate hikes. Is Fed doing the right thing without introducing a recession? Are markets correctly pricing in all those future rate hikes and adjusting inflation expectation accordingly? So there are a lot of uncertainties, just as Robert mentioned. So against the backdrop of uncertain rates, Fixed income experienced the worst quarter since 1980 with a loss of more than um, roughly 6% and largely le led by long, long duration bonds. So if you look at the Q1 performance, there's no one to hide. You know, even the safest one to three years short treasuries were down 2.5%. Um, so basically any fixed income risk you took during the quarter other than three month T-bill did not pay off. So among fixed income uh, tips, even though down 3%, outperformed their nominals by roughly 3%, benefiting from higher inflation and higher inflation expectation, and up 4% up on a one-year basis. Um, high yield did better than investment corporate bonds, and short high yield um, is one of the best performing or the least negatively performing bonds during the quarter in our portfolios. So you can see this is how we manage different risk premiums. Duration is not the only risk and inflation is not the only risk. So we have bonds like short duration credit in the portfolios to be optimized along with duration in order to obtain this portfolio efficiency for long-term investments. And on the other hand, stronger dollar weight on performance of international treasuries and emerging market stats. Um, so, and this is not only for a fixed income. Um, equities fell as much as bonds during the first quarter. Global equities were down close to 6%. And the only places where you saw big positive numbers were coming from energy and the commodity related asset classes and economy. So in our portfolios, Canada is one of the examples. Um, Canada is a natural resource intensive economy. So it really benefited from higher commodity prices. Gold is another example, up more than 5%, providing additional stability to our portfolios. And there are several other major themes to note here. Um, value and high dividends did relatively well this quarter. Value outperformed growth by more than 10%. And we continue to see this 
um, downward pressure on growth stocks given this high, um, this rising yields environment. Um, on the other hand, European equities were more affected by Russian invasion, but overall, international equities performed on par with US equities. Emerging markets were pulled down by China because of more aggressive measure um, in terms of COVID. So overall, it was a very challenging quarter for both fixed income and equities investing. And what does that mean for our portfolios? And I would like to start with our global indices. So our indices are constructed in the same way as our portfolios. So they provide um, the real term performance of our investments and provide this transparency to you. And you can look up indices performance on the website or on your phone. And here I'm showing six global indices representing six risk profiles from 2080 to all equity against the blended equity and treasury uh, three month T-bill benchmark for this quarter and also for one year performance. And as you can see, for this quarter, the indices were down four to 5.5% and fixed income portion underperformed the uh, T-bill benchmark, uh, which explained much of the underperformance here. On the bright side, um, they still, the fixed income portion still outperformed uh, US aggregate bonds. So that means our total investment still did better than broad markets. And moving on to our portfolio performance, starting with Global Core. So Global Core are our flagship um, long-term total return portfolios trying to capturing um, this global um, risk premiums for long-term investments. And I'm here I'm showing not only Q1, but one year, five year and 10 year performance. Um, so looking at Q1 performance um, consistent with broad markets, um, they were down four to 5.7% during the quarter. And you will notice uh, there's not much risk, you know, return, this return dispersion among different risk profiles. Um, and that's because everything went down together. Um, even for the most conservative 2080 profile, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's extremely difficult to avoid losses because you have to take additional risk in order to maintain your inflation adjusted investment objective. So 6040 on the other hand has the most balanced exposure to different risk premiums. And proportionately it has higher um, allocation to more riskier, to riskier bonds like long duration bonds. And um, so therefore 6040 has a relatively higher duration profile than 2080 and 4060. So why are we having this duration in our portfolios? And I think it's important to be reminded that rate hikes are not always bad for treasuries. And especially when people are more concerned about, you know, about, about recession, about uh, financial um, downturns. So maintaining this recession protection or this risk hedging in your portfolios by holding modest exposure to duration relative to your risk profile is a very, very different thing from using duration as a return seeker uh, you know, return seeking assets to trying to outperform, trying to beat the markets. So, and we're seeing these benefits in our know, portfolios as portfolios are experiencing less volatility than broad markets during the first quarter. And move on to tax sensitive. Um, so because, well, because we constructed tax sensitive portfolios in a very similar way as Global Core, same philosophy, same, um, um, technology and process, and except that there are a lot more tax considerations going into managing tax sensitive portfolios. So therefore, um, they have tilts towards more tax efficient asset classes like municipal bonds and growth stocks. And that's why you're seeing a, some differences in numbers between tax sensitive and global core. And at the same time, we pay close attention to qualified dividends and capital gain distributions and it's important to note here that our portfolios uh, distribute close to 0% of ETF capital distributions in 2021 across all our portfolios. And, and, it's, and actually we're seeing this uh, extremely low distributions since portfolio inception, thanks to the tax efficient ETFs. And last but not least, we have multi-asset income portfolios. 
So they are more different from total return portfolios in a way that they focus on high dividends, less consistent dividends. And um, because of that, um, multi-asset income portfolios did relatively better in Q1 because of high dividends. High dividends were more, are more resilient um, in this rising yields environment. And, and that's why you're seeing um, this 70 by 25 with higher equity ex exposure did better than 40, 60. And our portfolios are currently providing this trailing yields of roughly 3.3 to 3.8% and even higher yields if um, you measure that in a forward looking way. For example, as you see, three, 30 day yields, uh, it's roughly more, uh, it's more than 44% across our portfolios. And as Robert mentioned, we added tips into multi-asset income portfolios during the first quarter uh, in response to higher inflation and also for enhancing yields. And we always want to be nimble without being tactical in this special environment and to maintain portfolio efficiency, not only for short term, but also for long term. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Jesse. Uh, thanks, Joy. That's a great performance review. A lot of great takeaways there for advisors. Um, we'll summarize at the end, but a lot of information to absorb there. Um, I think we're going to turn it over to Robert here shortly, but before we do that, uh, we're going to have a poll question. We have a couple polls here, so we'd love if you could uh, just take this poll. What is the top investment concern in the current market environment? I'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Inflation, rising interest rates, or political and global market concerns? I'm going to say, I'm going to guess it's going to be rising rates, but maybe inflation. Let's see what everybody says. Well, it looks like uh, inflation takes the cake. Uh, 44%, followed by rising interest rates at 35%, and then uh, geopolitical concerns, 21%. So uh, I don't think there's any surprises there. And so, uh, you know, between inflation, interest rates, and recession, uh, why don't I turn it over to Robert uh, to give us some insight? This is also the LinkedIn poll we did. So the results were a little bit different today, but it's a very uh, fluid environment. As, as to why we're calling this tug of war. Or so. All right, Robert, uh, what do you have, Nostradamus here to tell us about inflation or interest rates? What's happening? All right, thanks, Jesse. Um, let's see if I can, good, start going. So, uh, right, so this was, this was a, a challenging quarter. Uh, the big picture, it's, it's always about the economy, but which way are we looking at the economy? And I think a lot of people are viewing the economy through the lens of inflation and inflation is really impacting everything. And it's definitely driving what is uh, determining the Fed policy, which is what's driving interest rates. And the Fed is very data-driven. It's about the uh, jobs, and but the impact of inflation is uh, goes it goes beyond the economy and even goes into politics. I was, I was looking at a piggy bank and I was telling that piggy bank, you're, you're worth 6% less than you used to be worth. And that's just a, a kind of a surprising reality because it, inflation was something that we almost didn't think about. It's like, oh yeah, when I was uh, in college, that pizza used to be cheaper, but it, it's something that you don't think about really consciously. So uh, other big things, of course, are Ukraine, uh, the pandemic moving to endemic, but still having supply chain issues, which also impacts inflation and what's going on with the market. So uh, this tug of war concept, we had a lot of fun with it. I kind of had a, a lot of fun with it uh, in terms of trying to to think about, well, you have this yield curve and the Fed is pulling hard on one part of the yield curve. What goes on with the rest of it? What are all the economic forces at play? And given uh, the amount of uncertainty going on in the world, its yield curve could end up just about anywhere and so could the economy with it. On the one hand, we have a booming economy, according to some people anyway, doesn't feel like it with uh, job uh, the uh, 
GDP. We can talk about that later, but we have really low employment. We have uh, companies still willing to invest, consumers that are willing to spend a lot. On the other hand, we have uh, invasions, we have inflation, we have supply chains still very much affecting things, especially with uh, what's happened in China. So uh, inflation, it hit a new peak, uh, whether you think of it as eight and a half or something slightly lower, uh, like six and a half, uh, if you take out the volatile energy and food parts, uh, it certainly has been exacerbated by the invasion of Ukraine in terms of food and energy prices, especially. I don't think anyone is saying that it's going to go away magically tomorrow. This whole transitory argument is is really well in the past. Um, but there is some thought that it could be at a turning point. And you see it spiking across all of these different countries and really everywhere but um, Asia, pretty much. And some of these don't have the, the latest March number, so they could be even worse. But um, but there's some hope that it will start to turn. Uh, the rate hikes from federal uh, central banks haven't really kicked in yet, and those are very much designed to combat inflation. And at some point, supply chains will ease and uh, the economy will get back to operating at full capacity. And uh, people are getting tired of the pandemic all over this country, at least. So that hopefully will be happening sooner than later. <clears throat> so um, market performance last, I just wanna bring up that a quarter ago, I was talking to you and saying that looking back on 2021 and 2020, these were really exceptional times. There are lots of single event things that we cannot count on to happen again, that really boosted stock returns, especially over that time period. And 2022 this year is going to be different and we shouldn't expect such high returns. Of course, I'm always just thinking about let's all be reasonable and taper our expectations back towards a, a more central, more probable perspective. And of course, was not expecting this quarter to be as, uh, as bad as it has been. And this is definitely something where things have gotten worse than expected. And uh, uh, a big part of what's uh, been expected, worse than expected, everything's down, everything except for energy and commodities. Joy talked about this a lot, don't wanna bore you again, but I do wanna emphasize that it was bad for stocks, but really bad for bonds. And so uh, that makes us go back to uh, NTSB mode and say, well, are things still behaving the way they should? Uh, short-term asset correlations are actually still working okay. And there is this uh, silver lining argument perhaps where the economy is still relatively strong. Volatility is higher than we want, but it's not unmanageable. And the good thing about interest rates rising is it lets certain parts of the economy function in a much more normal way, especially the financial sector, bank accounts, and uh, and it gives more room to move. And so that's not a bad thing in and of itself for interest rates to go up a little bit. A lot of people were unhappy that they were so low for so long. Uh, one of the components of what we're looking at, of course, is, uh, is, is Russia. And uh, the most important thing to point out here is that there is little direct harm to investor portfolios. Russia is a small part of GDP, a very small part of portfolios. It's like uh, you know 1% of emerging markets. Now it's in no investable portfolios. It was taken out of all indices. And I have no idea what Russian assets are actually worth, the rubles being played with, and no one really does. But uh, I'm, I think everybody is very happy that no portfolio has any exposure directly to any Russian asset anymore. Now, inflation. I, I want to think about does what does inflation mean going forward? So we know there's been a lot of inflation in the past. Does that mean a couple of simple questions? Does that mean that you should be concerned about investing in stocks or you should be concerned about investing in bonds or, or some combination of this? And so I looked at data, uh, looked at more than 100 years, but the last 80 is at least a little bit more relevant. And 
the simple answer is there's really no relationship between inflation from the last year and stock or bond or the difference between stock and bond prices going forward. So the point of these curves is that I, I looked at all combinations, uh, sorry, not curves, dots, uh, but uh, what you'll see is that there's really no serious relationship between uh, in past inflation and future returns of any kind. So that gives you some confidence that you wanna understand what your portfolio should be, you wanna understand what the risk of your portfolio is, uh, but don't don't make big investment decisions just because we had some inflation in the past. What inflation does really matter for is the Fed. And if you want to just focus on uh, the green line, which are in uh, shortish term inflation expectations, two year inflation expectations, and then the white line, which is the market's interpretation of what the Fed says it's going to do as far as rate hikes go, you can see that as inflation started, expectations started to creep up over the last year, that it, there was a very direct relationship between what people thought the Fed was going to do and what the Fed indeed was communicating that it was going to do in terms of rate hikes. <clears throat> but right now, uh, real yield is very low. So this is the a yield curve, the blue line as uh, the yield curve as of the end of last quarter. It's higher now, as we all know. But uh, the red line is the inflation adjusted yield curve. And the thing I want to point out here is just how negative it is. If you are invested in a short term treasury or any or a bank account or a CD or anything remotely like that, if you're not taking any risk with your investment accounts, then you are guaranteeing almost that you're going to be losing uh, real purchasing power. This is my conversation with the piggy bank of you're just, it, you piggy bank, you gotta be doing something else because you've just lost 6% of your value over the last year and you're going to lose another 4% at least over the next year. So, Thinking about the components of what we're investing and thinking about how the portfolios fit together. And there's a, a dilemma that I just hinted at for conservative investors, which is sometimes we get the question of, well, if we all know that interest rates are going up, does that mean that a conservative investor should actually be all in stocks? And the answer is no, because you markets always price the risk and return relationship of various asset classes so that safer things are not expected to reward investors as much. That's, that's how, how they work. So stocks are, are still risky, but bond, bond volatility is high, uh, relatively speaking, it's still not more risky than stocks. And if you're too conservative, you're likely to invest in negative real returns. And uh, this is where I say that even if you're conservative, even if you're really just worried about uh, holding on to your purchasing power, I wouldn't recommend going all the way to cash because that's uh, guaranteeing you'll lose. Of course, it also guarantees that you won't lose by more than 4% or so, but I think uh, markets should be probably, especially over time, able to do a, a lot better than that. It's also a challenge for building a balanced portfolio. When you build a balanced portfolio, you do have uh, these balancing the future return expectations that may be lower, thinking about uh, a, a very dynamic relationship between stock risk and bond risk, and want to make sure that the correlations between stocks and bonds are still what we thought they were, and that you still are getting diversification benefits. And are there new asset classes that you should be considering? So I, I think there are some answers to some of those questions but it, it is a challenge. So just focusing on the correlations, one of the most between stocks and bonds, which is one of the most important inputs into designing a optimized, well-diversified, well-risk managed portfolio, because you've got to understand what are the bonds doing and how do they relate? Um, I want to remind people that correlations is not the same thing as direction. So, 
I picked on the left a five-year period where markets were going up and interest rates were going down. So it was a good time to be a stock investor or a bond investor, which has been a lot of experience in the last 10 years or so. And But uh, correlations between stocks and bonds have been consistently negative over that time period. So we we're very concerned and said, well, recently has that changed? And we, especially when you looked at what Joy showed you, which is that everything went down 6% last quarter and has gone down even more this month. So is everything gone down in lockstep? And clearly it hasn't. So that is reinforcing that there are different things going on in the markets. Uh, the reason why things happened, returns were as poor as they were last quarter was because you thought things were bad and then okay markets have accounted for that and then there's another negative surprise and then another negative surprise and it, we have a feeling of always being one step behind but that doesn't mean that uh, the relationships between asset classes aren't aren't still working and that's that's important to be paying attention to and this is just the long-term picture for uh, treasuries correlations are uh, occasionally go positive for a little bit, but have been predominantly negative between stocks and bonds. But the more important thing I wanted to show you is the top blue line, which is the treasury volatility index, which is called the move index. For, uh, and so the, and what you see all on the way on the right is where we are now, which is uh, possible hinting that we might be in a, a continued period of high fixed income volatility. And so aside from a couple spikes, this is about as bad as it gets. Uh, commodities, I just wanted to address commodities because these have been the best asset class by far for the for recent time last year-ish. Uh, but some commodities really aren't investable and we don't, we don't have them in our portfolios. Why don't we have them in our portfolios? Should we have had them in our portfolios? And just think about commodities themselves, they're highly volatile uh, and they don't, you know, they don't have, they're not a regular investment asset. Also think about the instruments. Uh, the instruments for uh, commodity investing is, is not always what you would want to be investing in. Um, they essentially a big reason is that you have to be you can't just have a grain silo or a big warehouse full of steel bars or whatever uh, things you uh, want you have to have generally invest in them through futures and that means that if you uh, if everybody agrees that prices are going to rise for commodities in the future than they already have and you're not actually going to be able to benefit from that insight this contrasts with what we do do, which is we do invest in gold ETFs. And then you also should think that there are parts of our portfolio, certain markets like Canada and Australia, that have a lot of commodity exposure and get benefits uh, to them as well. And those are really efficient investment options. So one thing that uh, we occasionally need to remind ourselves of is that when you're thinking about efficient investing over time, you don't ever want to be investing in a speculative asset class. I talked about why we don't buy the Bitcoin ETF among other reasons is because it's not an efficient representation of cryptocurrencies. It's, and so if you're investing in poor representations of an asset class, you're going to be losing out over time. So TIPS, uh, TIPS is a perfectly valid asset class. And this is something that we've added to some of our portfolios and has something we've been uh, paying attention to a lot lately. And uh, because of course, when you're thinking about inflation, you're thinking about, well, how can you protect against it? But I wanna remind you that inflation is driving the Fed interest rate policy. So uh, when you have high inflation expectations, if so, just do a thought experiment, suppose they were to rise, then the expectation would be that the Fed would raise rates more. So if you owned a TIP, you'd say, oh, new surprise to positive surprise to inflation. That's OK. I, I, got, I have TIPs. I should be covered. But then what else is going on? Well, they're a bond that does have duration and interest rate exposure. So when the interest rate expectation goes up, the Fed is probably going to have to be more aggressive to hike rates more, and interest rates will rise. And the net effect is you won't be as protected from inflation as you think. And whether it be for 
uh, on the good side or or the on the negative side. And recently, at least, uh, tips have been roughly a 50% inflation hedge because of this relationship with the Fed. This is a picture of uh, tips versus similar duration intermediate treasuries. And so when inflation expectations start to drive things, then they'll diverge. Uh, China, uh, just to bring up uh, China, which is something that we removed from our portfolios over time. I wanted to point out that uh, there is a, a, the main reason was is our investors getting rewarded for investing in China lending in Chinese equity markets. And there was this very spectacular day or two where the Chinese government seemed to be announcing that it would be stopping this policy of regulating the tech industry as much as it had been. And there was a, a huge 20% spike in one day. Uh, and if you were really focused, it was actually much more than a 20% spike on the certain on the most affected type of Chinese stocks. But uh, unfortunately for investors, this hasn't uh, really fully confidently played out. And so it was not the right time to invest in China. Of course, uh, COVID zero policies and outbreaks in Shanghai don't help Chinese markets either. So the ETF landscape and what's going on there. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is uh, that there have been continued mutual funds ETF conversions, and this is good for the ETF industry, good for people investing in ETFs, and it's just an acknowledgement that this is really the more modern way to be investing and building portfolios. A sharp reminder of why someone might prefer ETFs over mutual funds was a month ago when Vanguard got sued by a bunch of their investors for having too much and some supposedly unnecessary capital gains in their mutual, some of their target date mutual funds. And, uh, and this is uh, without, it, this is because of changes in uh, the structure of the mutual funds and causes withdrawals and then, and then the people invested are left holding the tax bag. Uh, but this wasn't just Vanguard. Uh, this happened to a number of other invest, uh, mutual funds, especially target date mutual funds last year. But it also happens not just in target date mutual funds. It can happen in anyone. Uh, I'm bringing this up because taxes, tax day is hopefully, thankfully, behind most of us. But uh, you know, trying to build a really tax efficient portfolios is one of the things that we do and uh, pay a lot of attention to. Um, so uh, what do I want to leave you with? I, I think we all understand that inflation is affecting everything right now. It's uh, affecting uh, the Fed policy most of all, Biden's approval rating. You could make the argument that because uh, uh, the pandemic and inflation concerns that uh, Western democracies were kind of lost their nerve and were in a weakened state, which allowed Russia to invade Ukraine because you know, they're not going to make inflation worse by getting rid of uh, Russian oil, right? So hopefully that will, that will get better, but uh, stock market valuations and expectations for growth stocks are as highly influenced by interest rates. And, uh, and that has to do with both the speed of the economy, as well as sort of the discount rate. Uh, how desirable is it to be an investor in some sense? which affects uh, stock valuations as well. So it's always a combination of two, these two things. Um, so another thing is that you want to think about, if you're thinking about inflation or you're thinking about any risk in general, always think about your whole portfolio, all of the assets in your portfolio, and is your whole portfolio, uh, is each of these assets accounting for those types of risks rather than saying, I'm going to put everything on just tips or just commodities or just one sp specific asset class because that's doing a couple of things. It's ignoring that there are other types of risks out there that are probably going to, uh, you know, that could be popping up in the future. And the mar and markets already know and is already worried about inflation. So every asset is already priced to take this into account. And the, the other part is that uh, different assets, even 
uh, like equities have some inflation hedging components to them as well. So, uh, and just looking back and looking forward, while this was a poor quarter for bonds, for this something as bad to happen again would be mathematically difficult because that would be a comparable level of surprise that would make us think just as we did over the last quarter, oh, there's going to be about eight more rate hikes than we were expecting earlier. Well, now there would have to be 16 more rate hikes than we were expecting. And that seems a little bit implausible. So why don't we pause here and go to questions and give it back Great. to Jesse. Uh, thanks, Robert, uh, for summarizing that. Uh, before we do go to Q&A, Joy and Dr. Michelle are going to be joining us here on screen. Um, but I think we're going to pop up one more poll question, if you wouldn't mind, and then go into question. What is the likely outcome of the Fed's anticipated rate hike? Inflation will worsen and the Fed will have to tighten faster. The Fed will proceed with the planned nine rate hikes or inflation will moderate and there will be fewer hikes than anticipated. Give you a few seconds to answer that, move on to Q&A. Drum roll, please. All right, it looks like uh, inflation will moderate in fewer hikes than anticipated. So to quote uh, a podcast I heard recently, it's one thing to say you're gonna raise rates, it's another thing to actually do it. And so with that, uh, why don't we pop up uh, the first question here? Uh, Dick, are you with us out there? I sure am. All Hi. right. Well, thanks for joining us today. So the first question we want to touch on, a lot of questions on inflation. So it's just simply, you know, what are your thoughts on inflation and where do you see it going from? Well, I, I think that Robert did a, quite a nice job on a number of things as far as inflation and, and, and Joy did touch on it as well. But let me just quickly, because we don't have a whole lot of time left here, uh, practically every investor has been in, in, impacted by inflation and fears and declines in capital markets. The, the S&P was down 11% now, uh, the NASDAQ 20%, the Dow 7%. And of course, the fixed income markets uh, are also uh, agreeing. So there's no place to hide. This last year, you know, the S&P was up 27% and the NASDAQ was up 23%. It's a little bit of a change, right? So it does depend on the time periods and we have been living through a strange time period. So uh, what, what I want to do here is, is just talk a little bit about the uh, different factors. The uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, is an ugly and depressing war. Uh, uh, we have seen threats of nuclear war. Uh, this is not serious, it's unserious. Uh, Putin has been uh, planning this for a long time. But there's some interesting uh, news here that he, is he medically well? I don't know if you've seen his uh, shaky hand. And there are some good news here. So this, uh, I, what Robert's uh, idea of a tug of war, that Zelensky is doing well, the impact on global he hegemony, it's just absolutely amazing. Putin did not believe that Europe would uh, fall in line with the US and other countries. And the Biden administration has been supporting Ukraine full time. The Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve uh, needs to tame inf uh, inflation. And Jerome Powell said, that's what we're going to be doing. So 50 basis point hikes are definitely what's happening shortly here. Janet Yellen had a very interesting um, a speech here, just uh, I think, I believe it was yesterday, talking about the uh, impact of stimulus on, on inflation. Uh, if you remember, to, to 2020, we had a stimulus prep program with uh, Donald Trump as president. And now, of course, in 2021, we had another uh, even larger stimulus package, which uh, Janet was saying is that uh, maybe we were worried too much. Uh, maybe we put too much stimulus. We don't know. OK, uh, certainly other central banks are not in a position to help. That's the big problem here. And, and, and so this has been a big impact on global and economic growth. There's no question about it. And then we had not only the Fed and the Ukraine and so on, but the pandemic. It's been a negative impact on common experience. I, I don't know if anybody believes, <laughs> feels the same way I do, but it's, it's been really difficult getting up in the morning for now for quite a long time. <clears throat> uh, there have been 1 million deaths in the US loan, 80 million recovered, 
six million deaths global, and then all of this impact on, on uh, economic functionality. Supply chain had been a major impact in global economic growth here in the United States, and more recently in, in China as well. And on the other hand, there is good news, the impact of the vaccines. And uh, according to uh, Anthony Fauci, we're now going from a pandemic to a, an endemic. And so I'll be uh, taking my uh, booster shots with my uh, flu shots uh, shortly. A negative view of China. <sighs> if there are major lockdowns in, in, under uh, President Xi's COVID policies, remember Shanghai has 25 million people Talk about a, a lockdown with 25 million people in the United States. You can't, you can't imagine it, okay? And uh, Russia, uh, China's been uh, supporting the Russia uh, ruble and policies and so on. And there is a major supply chain issue in, in China. Uh, there are 500 ships just sitting around in Shanghai Harbor right now. It's even worse than it used to be in uh, Los Angeles. A U.S. poll just recently, 82% negative views on China. And that's a big, big change. Change. So how much inflation? Recent decline in economic growth in the first quarter, but not for some serious factors. So we got a, a little bit of a news, but it wasn't very large and it wasn't very necessarily significant. We're supporting, uh, people are supporting the Russian ruble in policies. Well, uh, that's a big problem. Um, we have major supply chain, uh, I'm sorry, we, have, we, we don't have uh, uh, Venezuela inflation, right? Uh, Venezuela inflation is 2,000% plus. So where's the recession? When you go to a parking lot in the mall, it's full. Where's the recession? Companies disappear and then uh, quickly reappear here in Boston and New York and any other city that I've been to recently. There's a lot of, of uh, new construction. The dollar is extremely strong relative to all currencies, all major currencies going forward. So what the economists have been telling us? The possibility of a recession in 2022 or a mild recession in 2022 or Perhaps not. <laughs> anyway, it does depend uh, an awful lot on an awful lot of things that, uh, as Robert and, and Joy were saying, it really we can't really control. So stay well diversified uh, for the future. Let me turn it over back to Jesse. Thanks a lot, Dr. Michelle. Um, just you know, questions coming in. Just a quick one: probability of a recession in late 2022 or 2023. I think Christine just asked Robert, "Do you want to touch on that?" You know, I know you watch probabilities a lot, so I don't know if you have any answer, quick answer to that. Um, yeah. So, well, it went up a little bit, and I think a lot of people's answer to the poll expresses what's in a lot of our guts, which is that there's a good chance that things are. Uh, starting to inflation, pan pandemic not ending as soon as it was that we'd like, and other events, some of these other things pulling on the tug of war, uh, may do the Fed's job for it and slow down the economy sooner than we'd like. So there is there is that risk. And so while clearly the everyone thought the Fed was too slow before, there's now some concern that the Fed could go too fast and too hard. And uh, but I, I I do have some faith that the Fed will understand that and not massively mess up. I think they'll probably minorly mess up because we're all human. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I know we're we're up against the hour, but there's a lot of people still on the line. If you have time and you want to, we're going to take a few more questions. But uh, you know, don't feel like you have to. If you have to run off, we understand. Uh, we'll, we'll get some answers out as well. The next thing here is just relating it to our portfolios, Robert, why don't you, you know, there's a lot of concern in the fixed income space and what types of adjustments have we made or might we consider in the fixed income side of the portfolio, given the volatility around fixed income? Right. So we, we already have made a lot of adjustments and we've had a, a pretty healthy exposure to duration for much of our 18 year history of investing in portfolios. And in December, 
we lowered it to, it was under uh, 5% or so in the portfolios. And that is the lowest exposure to long treasuries we've ever had. And it's, remember, it's in there for risk management. It's in there because it is, that's why I had so many slides on correlations, because we're really concerned that, that we're understanding all the risks in what we're investing. And you don't want to build a conservative portfolio that's just all high yield bonds. Uh, that's not a conservative portfolio either. So this is, this is the conservative investor's dilemma right now of how do you uh, manage the risk of maintaining real purchasing power uh, with inflation high and bonds guaranteed to not make it. And that has definitely dramatically increased the risk of everything. And so sometimes you can see the risks and sometimes it's harder to see the risks. It's, that's why I brought up this piggy bank. The piggy bank looked like it was really just safely sitting there on the shelf, but that piggy bank was going through a, a rough year and it didn't even know it. No. Um, thanks for that, Robert. I like the, the piggy bank analogy. I think that helps a lot. Um, now, you know, switching to asset class, how do you add other asset classes, a question we had to your portfolio over time. And so I think I'm gonna actually ask the question behind the question, because I think what a lot of people are asking, you already touched on it, commodities, cryptos, or even Mark uh, from Tucson chimed in and said, hey, about commodities, are you considering anything in South America? And so how do we look at asset classes and what are we really looking for? Um, all right. So the the direct investment in commodities is something we've looked at extensively. And it's, if you think about right now, everybody, of course, wants to be investing in commodities. So future prices are really high. This is the markets working, which means that they're not an obviously good deal right now. Sure, if you've got space in your backyard or an empty grain silo, fill it up. But you can't do that with the portfolio. So the investing in commodities is difficult. So that's why we're looking at the rest of the portfolio, making sure the rest of the portfolio has the exposures that are as inflation hedging as possible through through things like gold, through things like uh, perhaps individual equity markets that they can uh, they can more efficiently for at the portfolio level and over time uh, give you those same types of risk hedges. And Joy, is there anything you want to add there as far as ETFs and, and what the investment committee looks at? Is there something else you'd like to add in on that? Yeah, I think um, also a lot of people are asking about China and how we think of China investing. And Robert has already um, brought a lot of good points about China investing as to how we think of China as a single country allocation of portfolios. Um, as you know, we have Canada, we have Switzerland, and we used to have China uh, in our portfolios, all for very different reasons. So, um, so for example, China in this case, you know, in 2020, China um, has a successful control of COVID um, and outperformed other equities and was the best performing um, equity in our portfolios at that time. So that really helped. Um, but this coming, you know, comes to 2022, it's a very different story. So Chinese companies, you know, are exposed or to some extent are more vulnerable to these policy changes and regulations compared to other equities. And this is a unique, you can say challenge or opportunity for investing in China. Um, so we we'll continue monitoring China investing. Uh, we, we got a rate of China at the end of last year and also this year across our portfolios. And we acknowledge China is an important part of our you know, global economy. So uh, there's more to see and we want more confidence or more evidence of China governments providing more concrete and transparent or predictable regulations for uh, for investors. Great. And then maybe, maybe just um, one more here. Uh, I don't know which one who wants to take it on the investment committee and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and, and people that are still on, we'd love it if you could take the survey uh, before you jump off. But just last question, what asset classes should conservative investors be monitoring as solutions for liquidity over the short term. Yeah, there's there's no neat answer to that. Uh, there's there's nothing there's no asset that will in the short term provide perfect safety 
and inflation projection at the same time. And that's an unfortunate reality of where we are right now. So I think it's important, that's why I think it's important to actually take a little bit of equity risk, even if you're very conservative. If you're talking about next month's down payment on a new house that you bought, then of course that's a different situation. But if you're talking about actually investing, then you wanna stay diversified and you wanna have a little bit of equity exposure because you're otherwise inflation will, will do you in. The, oh, oh, and our, our portfolio is designed for reliable long-term investing. And so presumably that is why you are investing with New Frontier. You could moderate the risk associated with uh, equity markets reflecting uh, uh, the underlying economy uh, with a 60-40 portfolio or 75-25 portfolio, but each one of them is in some sense being trying to optimize with respect to reliable long-term investing with respect to the client's um, the level of risk aversion. But all of them in some sense are optimized and are optimal for that purpose. So uh, in some sense, what is it you're trying to do? because uh, you can't really avoid, unless you happen to know uh, what's going to happen tomorrow, you can't really avoid what's going to happen tomorrow. So the, the, right, the right way to think about it is not you know, a state of course. The idea is to pay attention to your important legacy issues uh, and all of the other issues yet that you're thinking about in terms of investing. Great. Uh, thanks for finishing that up for us, Dr. Michaud. Um, well, we're well over the hour. I want to say thank you. And just a few key takeaways, just one you know, quick thing from each section, right? So one, our investment process. One thing that's unique that I always like to talk about is uncertainty. And we can't solve for uncertainty, but our investment process takes uncertainty into account, right? So very, very important about New Frontier, right? When we're talking about Joy's performance overview, you know, there was nowhere to hide. It's really easy to look at last quarter and go, oh, I wish I would have had commodities. I wish I would have had managed futures. Well, I can tell you from looking at performance of those two asset classes over the last decade, you wouldn't have liked the returns over the last decade. So like, don't go jumping into something because it did last quarter. It, there was really nowhere to hide. Risk profile, uh, one through six, you know, it just didn't matter. And then, you know, I thought something really unique Robert said that I hadn't really heard is, talking about the 80 year history of the correlation of the next year's market returns versus the prior year's inflation, there's really nothing evidence to point there just because we've had high inflation that um, that's gonna mean markets do something, right? So again, we optimize and diversify because of uncertainty. Um, we take all this into account. We appreciate your business and we look forward to working with you. And if there are any questions uh, that we did not address, uh, please feel free to reach out to either myself, David Schubach in the East, or Nick Lamb is always back in the Boston office doing all the heavy lifting for us. So thanks for everybody here today. Uh, Investment Committee and New Frontier, thank you. We appreciate it. And everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.